tonight, right? Which I suspect my fellow panelists might consider a little galling. But okay, and we're going to start out with I'm going to show you about three or four galls uh, that are caused by formed by different uh, kinds of insects. The first is a petio gall that we find on cottonwood and other poplars, and it's you see if you get this little uh, sphere that's formed, this is caused by an aphid, and don't hurt the tree a bit. Uh, just sort of a mutualistic type of relationship. So petio gall on cottonwood, uh, one of the really cooler galls. The second one that I think that all of our viewers have seen, this is called hackberry gall or hackberry nipple gall. And again, this is caused by an insect called a psyllid that looks sort of like a miniature cicada. So again, the larva develops in here, they come out in the fall, and sometimes they invade your house, these little cicada-looking things. They're only about a sixteenth of an inch long. Hackberry nickel gall and hackberry psyllid. Uh, this is a fun one. And we're seeing a lot of this on bur oak, white oak. And this is called oak bullet gall, and many of you may have seen this, in fact. And again, what we get is these, these little uh, cone-shaped galls that are on the twig. Sometimes on a smaller tree can actually cause a fair amount of damage and actually die back of that, uh, of, that, of that terminal growth. Just quick, here's what they look like when they are, are during the winter time, you know, after they've completed development. And the last one that we've talked about on the show, but I just wanted to talk about once more, this is ash flower gall, all right? And this is caused by a tiny plant feeding mite. And again, these are the male flowers, uh, and the mites feed on those flowers and cause this deformation. There seems to be a lot more this year than there are, that we've seen in, in recent years. And I have no idea why that is. So gall night, Four different kinds of galls caused by four different kinds of insects. Thank you so much, Fred. If you have those on your plants, enjoy. Okay, what Thank do you, you have, Rock? That is not enjoyable. No, this is not enjoyable. And actually, a little background on this is uh, Brad Mills, our producer from Extensions, uh, father brought this in. And uh, Brad's father is well known as a coach in the Holdridge area, now retired. So kudos to him for showing up and bringing us a sample. Uh, basically, this is one of the thistles and uh, I'm not sure which one it is, so I will not take the time Fred did because I have one sample, and basically this is one of the thistles' alter alternate leaves. Um, it was found in an iris bed. If you have more than this one, pull the rest of them up and get them before they totally flower and drop their uh, seeds. I can't tell you. I'm going to take it home. We'll figure out what it is, and I'll let uh, Brad know, and he can convey the message to you. Makes, it, makes kind of a good mustache when you hold it up. Like this. <laughs> No, ow. <laughs> All right. Amy, <laughs> what did you bring? <laughs> oh, I had to, of course, bring those wonderful rots and spots, and I brought a bell pepper out of my garden. And we talk a lot about anthracnose that can infect tomatoes and peppers, and that's what had happened here. Uh, this tomato, or this is a pepper, not a tomato, sorry. Uh, my pepper plants are really short, and this one was actually touching the ground, and that's the reason why it's rotting from toward the bottom of the pepper and working its way up. But the nice thing about anthracnose, as you can kind of see on the screen, it grows in concentric patterns. So you get these little rings to develop. And so anthracnose can develop anywhere on the fruit itself. And on peppers, it's typically developing right when the pepper is ready to be picked and you're ready to eat that first pepper or that second pepper of the year. Um, there isn't a lot we recommend, you know, Making sure it's not touching the ground would probably be the first recommendation in my case here. Uh, mulch is always a good thing, soaker hoses, but a lot of times we're not going to recommend any fungicide applications for it. If you do have anthracnose, just cut that part out of the pepper, and you can still eat the pepper, it's just fine. So just a little insight on anthracnose on pepper. Thanks so much, Amy. Elizabeth, a beautiful shrub. I do have a beautiful shrub, and it's not one of the shrubs that we normally think of. What I have is a button bush. Um, it gets its name from the lovely white button-like flower. Um, before they bloom, they're in tight bud in this one, and then once they bloom, the spent flower um, kind of look like a little button. It's a native shrub. It can handle a wide range of soils from dry to wet. And when I looked up the size, the size range was 5 feet to 12 feet, which that's a little bit of a, a, a size gap between 5 foot to 12. I'd say closer to probably that 10 to 12. Um, a lot of people like this one because of the, the glossy leaves and the unique flower to it. So this is one that's not commonly seen uh, in the industry as much as what we'd like to see, but it is a really nice hardy shrub for our area. 
And the beauty of it is it smells like honey when it's in flower. Mm. <laughs> honey, Fred. Honey, thank you. OK, and Fred gets the first picture oh. tonight. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, it's a viewer from Omaha oh. who had their maple oh, yeah. prune. That's not an insect. <laughs> and a lot of the wood chips fell down into the hole. And then based on the amount of stuff that came out, he thinks the cavity was about a foot deep, washed out the debris, and saw these strange-looking white things with tails, wondered what they were. And we sent this around to uh, everybody from PATH to entomology to the critter guy, and it came back to Fred. Yeah. These are called rat-tailed maggots. Obviously, we get the name tail, and I guess they look like sort of like a, a rat. And uh, these are the larvae of, of a fly. And they actually live in shallow, warm, high organic water. We'll find them in uh, lagoons, right along the right along the bank, uh, in other situations where there's a really high organic matter around the base, around the shore of ponds. Okay, uh, the adult is called a drone fly because the adult looks very much like a male honeybee, a drone. And well, it'll be when you see a bee on a flower, like a goldenrod. In fact, often this is. Uh, one of those drone flies. So rat-tailed maggot uh, and, and the drone fly, no control necessary. They rarely reach numbers that would cause any problem. So truly, part of nature's wondrous pageantry. All right. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Rock, you get the first question tonight. This is a Norfolk viewer who wonders about Scott's Midwest blend grass seed and whether that is something we're familiar with and would that work in Norfolk? Um, these are great questions and a perfect time of year to seed. What I'm going to tell you is that there are a lot of mixtures out there from various companies. So without saying one is better than the other, I'm going to, you buy your seed in certified bags, okay? Make sure you've got a blue tag on it. Don't buy the small bags at the, at the box stores or even your local hardware store at, because you run the risk of introducing weed species and then we'll be having a conversation next year. And uh, we would rather not do that. So blue tag certified seed. Most of the companies in Nebraska that will sell you, you know, a quantity of seed in 25 or greater pounds, which is usually what you're going to need, have read our recommendations and incorporate them. So, and then sometimes they'll sell them to secondary marketers like the hardware stores. But look for that blue tag. If it's got blue tag certification, you're guaranteed that it's true to genetic type. You're also guaranteed that it's weed free and that there's definitely no noxious weeds in it. So I'm not going to slam one variety or one box over the other or one brand over the other. Just that if you've got a blue tag on it, you're pretty sure that the Nebraska people have looked at it, certified that it is what it is, and then you can be more confident in what you put in the ground. Same is true of you cropping people out there. You know, certified is always better. All right. Thanks, Rock. Uh, Amy, this is a viewer. We're not sure where on this one. Okay. They have a question about Japanese maple. Just wonders if the leaves are turning red for the fall from the top down on a couple of crunchy branches, or in fact, do we have something else going on? Okay, there could be a couple things going on. Uh, with the branches, just a couple of them turning, I would probably look at those branches and see if there's a canker, anything that's weeping, any sap, or if there's a sunken hole in there um, that could be inhibiting the water moving into that branch and causing the leaves to start crunching and starting to turn colors. But on the same side, if, as you drive across the state, you're starting to see trees turning colors already. And that does not indicate that there's anything wrong with the trees. It's that time of year and some trees are just starting to turn a little bit sooner than normal. So I would first look for that canker. And if there isn't a, can a canker, continue to water it until this fall and uh, wait and see what it looks like next spring. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, this is from our audience. This is a Hastings viewer who says they have an ash tree whose roots are becoming surface. They're wondering if it's because of the drought, age, et cetera. Is there anything that can be done about that? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, to start off, yes, it's probably caused by a few different things. Um, drought can be one of them. Um, ashes aren't known for having surface roots like maples are, or, you know, some spruces. So that could be an issue with it. Also, you know, if you've got anything planted underneath it and you've got a heavy mulch layer, sometimes those roots will come up to the mulch too. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Anything that you can do about it, the answer is no. Um, we don't recommend putting more than two inches of soil on top of those roots just because those roots are used to the air exchange and things like that. So once you start covering the roots with more and more soil, you're starting to take away that air exchange capacity of those roots. So we really don't like to recommend, you know, covering them up. 
However, if you have a lawnmower and you get lawnmower blight on those roots, you need to be careful because sometimes all those nicks and cracks and um, when they get hit with a lawnmower blade, it can cause some sprouts to come up that way. So be careful with the lawnmower in that area if you're mowing and you have turf under there, um, but there's really nothing you can do. All right, Fred, you have a question. This is from our audience. This is a viewer who has basswood, okay. lindens, and we've actually had a number of questions this year about uh, insects feeding on lindens. This particular one is mine cutting beetle, um, M-I-N-E. Mine cutting, cutting beetle. Well, I, I, I think this is a basswood leaf borer, uh, and it feeds between the in, as a larva between the upper and lower surface of the basswood leaf, uh, and it, it really can do a fair amount of defoliation. The challenge is, you know, it's feeding within the leaf, so how do you get a product to it? So probably the best way is to use one of the systemics, like Bayer Advanced. The uh, chemical would be imidacloprid that, uh, that you can purchase any of the local nurseries. Again, that would need to be applied right when you first start seeing that sort of uh, discoloration when the when the bores are first beginning uh, to do their tunneling. You know, by the time we notice it, generally damage is already done. So, all right. Uh, Thanks, that's, Fred. That's with bore. All right. Rock, you get the first picture tonight for you. And this is a, a viewer in Lincoln. Found uh, this particular plant in um, actually in a, in a uh, kind of a, a bad area. They want to know what it is, and they want to know how to get rid of it, and they're calling it stickies. They're calling it stickies. Yeah, that's our, Kim, that's our real good friend, puncture vine. But I have a couple of things. So right now, it's starting to seed out, and it gets the burrs on it, and, and it's really painful to step on them or get them in and around your body, basically. So to make a long story short, um, it's a little bit late to do anything now. Can we get back to me? But... Sir? In more recent times, you know, you, you've got to get rid of the seed reserve because it can produce, produce 500 to like 1,000 seeds per plant. Okay, so think about that. So if that plant makes it and you have 10 burrs, you know, how many plants, you know, do the math. I can't do it. I'm not bright enough, but that's a lot. So what you want to do is make sure that it never gets to this point. But so for those of you that are already at that point and you're tired of getting it stuck to your shoes and everything else, there's a couple of tricks you can do. Get some old carpet you know, a nice Berber or something like that. Shag's kind of an issue for those of you that still have the orange shag from your, from your I mean, 70s. <laughs> That's what he has now. He tried to find it, had order it special. But anyway, so you lay that carpet down on the area, and if you've got a big remnant piece, you know, when you recarpet it or whatever, and, and then just walk on it, you'll pick up a bunch of those birds. You'll be amazed how many birds you pick up. Take that off, brush it with a wire brush, and do that in each location, and you're getting rid of the seed source for next year. So next year, you put down one of the Scott's Halts or those type products if the area allows it to do it. And you know, if it was a turf area or a non-crop area, you could do that. So carpet now, get rid of the seeds as much as you can, avoid walking on it in bare feet. That's an obvious thing. And it generally is in thinner areas. So if it's turf, do something to get the turf thickened up and you won't have the problem. But once again, I like the carpet idea. And people have actually gone to the point where they would have a roller that, you know, and they would roll it out and roll it on the area and then brush it off to get rid of the burrs for the plants that they missed in any given moment. And it's, it's a lifelong obsession to get rid of puncture vine. And if you forget a year where you don't treat it uh, with a pre-emergent herbicide in the spring, you're gonna have a ton of those back again. So once they get to this point, you gotta get rid of those seeds and there's really no chemical way to do that short. Of, you gotta do it manually, which isn't a bad thing if you have nothing better to do with the piece of carpet. <laughs> Just, just a quick clarification. Yeah, I talked to, I said basswood bore. It's actually called the basswood leaf miner. And for you Google fans, uh, and you want to look it up, basswood leaf miner. And again, everything else I said was true. <laughs> it was Rock's fault. We can't even believe that Fred made a mistake. Please record that because, you know, <laughs> we're going to make a record of his big bonehead mistake. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, we have a question from our audience. This is an Omaha viewer. Okay. This may bounce to Elizabeth, but you get the first crack at it. All right. They have a Navajo willow. The leaves are turning yellow and falling off. Any, any idea why? So diseases of willows first, and then what they love, Elizabeth. There isn't a lot of diseases in willows, to tell you the truth. It's uh, actually a great tree to plant um, if you're running into problems with the disease issues. So most likely my thoughts would be environmental, or placing or planting too deep, different components like that, which I'm sure Elizabeth would be very happy to talk about. 
Yes, with the willows, um, as you look across um, and go across Nebraska, willows tend to like the wetter environments because um, it likes to have its feet wet. So, you know, if it's in a location on top of a berm or maybe in an area where it's not getting enough moisture, you can notice some issues that way. And like Amy said, the environmental issues, is it planted too deep? Is it in the wrong location? Are we getting reflected heat? Um, those can all cause them to drop their leaves a little sooner than normal. And right now, all you can really do is, is wait. Uh, make sure that it has adequate moisture going into the fall, about an inch of supplemental moisture a week, and then come next spring, just see how well it leafs out, whether or not you have some twig or branch die back at that time. And even though she sort of answered that when she gets another one, <laughs> which is also from the audience, and this is a Lincoln viewer, wondering whether hostas can be transplanted in the fall. Successfully? <laughs> <laughs> There's your answer, right? <laughs> There's your answer. Most of the time when we're looking at transplanting hostas in the spring, when you're just starting to see them peak out, it's going to be the best time. However, if you're moving or if you're not going to have that possibility of getting them back type of a thing or they need to be moved now, they can be. You just got to make sure that they're well watered and you kind of got to baby them. Um, so we'd prefer spring, but if there's, you know, circumstances where you, you just can't wait till spring, you could try to do it now and see if you can save the plant. Okay, Fred, uh, we have a question for you from a Columbus viewer. They have gnats, nasty gnats, and she's seen bitty gnats in her home and in businesses. So are they really gnats or are they something else and what to do about it? They're, they're probably gnats. They're probably called fungus gnats, and we, we see those associated with overwatered plants. So again, at home, you have, you have the plants inside, you overwater them, and then the, the gnat larvae live in the soil and they come out and they can be, there can be small clouds of them. The key to control is simply to go to a, a regular watering schedule, let it dry out a bit before you rewater so that soil actually dries out. Uh, there are some insecticides you could use, but generally it's a watering issue. All right, thanks, Fred. This is a, uh, an audience question from a viewer in York, or one of the people, and <laughs> when I first read this, I thought it said, can you control bindweed in established asphalt? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually asparagus rock. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, actually, Kim, that's a great story, because one time I went to visit a golf course superintendent, and you know, he had an older shop, and he had one of those little things you put underneath the chair, right? You know, so you're chair can back and forth. And he goes, come look at this. And we walked up. There was a bindweed plant growing up underneath, un between a crack in the foundation up underneath. And I just said, okay, that's it. We're, we're not going to mess with this weed it, it, anymore. Um, th there are some herbicides out there that will work on bindweed. And I'm not sure about labeled for asparagus. So I'm a little reluctant to make a quick recommendation. Um, but you know, the glove of death that we recommend all the time where you, you get the bindweed and you get it in your hands. Now remember, bindweed is actually an annual. So you, know, you want to get it before it flowers. And it also has one of these long residual soil life, like 70 to 90 years is the projection. So killing it once is not going to get rid of it. You got to be persistent. Once again, if you've got the cloth, you've got the plastic glove, over it you put a small cloth uh, glove, you dip it into or spray on a two to 5% solution of Roundup, grab the bindweed and slightly wipe it across without pulling out of the ground, and then you can translocate it in. But you wanna do it earlier rather than later, this time of year you're probably not gonna really do much because it's gonna die with the first frost. Catch it before it flowers. It's already flowered and shot its seed. So at this point in time, it's not nature's wondrous pageantry, because it's pretty irritating, but there's not much you can do about it. Hit up, get on it next year. All right, thanks, Rock. Amy, you get the next picture. Um, this is fun. This is fun. <laughs> Found this digging in a garden in Lincoln, and the, the description is it's squishy, like a pickled egg with transparent goo inside. That is actually the best description I've ever heard of this one. Um, this is actually an oval, or an o uh, like the egg of the stinkhorn. So they're encased in the soil, and if you cut open that case, then you get that nice ooey gooey mass. And so the sinkhorns are the ones that usually pop up. We see them in mulch, we'll find them in gardens, any place with a lot of organic matter. And then they pop up and they, a lot of times the stinkhorns are, have those red caps on them, those the brown on the top, 
really stinky, aka the stinkhorn. They attract the flies, and the flies then move the spores around. So there isn't a lot that we recommend uh, to doing with this. The fungus is actually very helpful. It's helping to break down that organic matter into the nitrogen and the phosphates and everything that the plants need to survive. So they're actually very beneficial in our landscapes. But they are a little strange when you come upon them and you find this ooey gooey mess as you're digging in the garden, uh, pulling up weeds or getting ready to plant those fall vegetables. So, And I'm guessing corn. the first time Lauren found one, since he's so afraid of snakes, he was <laughs> he, probably convinced that he was convinced, his life was, was a, over. It was a snake egg at one point in time. but. He's far past that now, so he knows what they are. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, you have a question about an ash tree. 18-inch uh, diameter limb just fell off. This tree provides good shade. They don't want to lose it. They're wondering if they should treat or paint that wound with anything or what they should do. And it used to be that the old recommendation was you wanted to paint it with tar and, and, or paint and put all that on there. Um, they've actually done studies to show that it actually does a great job sealing in the moisture and the fungus. Um, so if you leave it open to the environment, let it breathe, um, you're not going to have as many issues with the fungal rots and spots. That being said, there's the potential that that tree might not heal over properly, and you might have a big old open hole in the tree, and with time you might start to get some rot on there and could cause internal rot. So just be on the lookout um, with that side of the tree. If you start noticing you know, carpenter ants or critters going in and out of that hole, you might have some internal rot in the tree, and then you might want to contact an arborist to have them come out and take a look at the overall health of the tree. But leave it open to the environment. Fred, we have a question for you, and this is a spider question, my very favorite of the sort of insect-like things. <laughs> this Balls. viewer, yeah, this viewer has them in her bedroom and is unhappy oh. about that, waking up to find one like this, wonders how to take care of them. Well, you know, the, 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 the first thing to do is I would go, assuming these are probably some ground uh, crawling type of spider, uh, like a wolf spider, you know, I, I'd get some little sticky traps, uh, like the uh, cockroach hotels, and put them out and just put them into the corners and try to trap out as many as you can. You could use an aerosol spray uh, if you can find them and just give them a little black flag or raid or one of those would probably be the best way. And again, vacuuming. So if you have a, a little dust buster type thing or your vacuum you see one just suck it up all right thanks Fred uh, rock this is a viewer that has mulberry trees growing in their Austrian pines I know it's not turf bear with me after cutting what should they do for the stump how, how, how can they deal with weedy species in those sorts of situations so they want to retain the mulberry and the I didn't quite understand the no, question. No, they want the mulberry gone, and they want to know what to do about the stump in the windbreak. Uh, they can, you know, you know, tordon will work, but the trouble is, is anytime you get overlapping leaves, and I'm not sure with, sometimes conifers will send a, another conifer if the leaves overlap. I don't think that's true of um, a, a deciduous and a coniferous tree. So I would try one of the stumps, lightly brush it with a ready-to-use formulation of, of tordon, which is available at most of the Horsheimer stores like that and uh, it's already mixed for you, so you just use a paintbrush, and it should knock it back pretty good. Understand that once that, there be, will be other mulberries that decide they want to come back to home, and they'll pop up as well. So uh, you can hit those with Roundup, and some people have just, I'm rambling here a little bit, some people just simply mix a 2,4-D Roundup solution right after they cut it and paint it on there. So if you have to go in on the stump and cut it again just with a uh, chainsaw or whatever, and immediately before it has the time to callus over, that 2,4-D Roundup mixture will get translocated, and that generally does a pretty good job as well. So actually, I talked myself out of the Tordon because of the relationship with the root transfer. So go with 2,4-D and Roundup, brush it on, spray it on however you want, but make sure you've got a cut edge of the mulberry. Excellent. We always like it when we correct ourselves. That's why we're so good. I like it better when I correct Fred, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, AJ. And I never get to correct Rock. Yeah. All right, uh, this is a viewer that has red oaks. Okay. And they, uh, the leaves are curling a bit. We have, they know we've talked about this before with oaks. They're not entirely sure what's going on, and, and they like to know what it is and how okay. to take care of it. If you're in, like, the southeast Nebraska area, we do have a disease called sudden, uh, sudden oak. Um, 
that disease, you're going to see some crinkling of the leaves, but a lot of times you're going to see anal venal ne necrosis. So in between the veins, that the tissue is going to die, but the vein still stays alive. Um, mm -hmm. It's a root-borne, soil-borne uh, disease. Uh, it is detrimental to the trees. Uh, the oak trees will die over time. The best thing to do, though, is if you have a tree that you suspect, you really need to send it into the plant pest diagnostic clinic. But here's the kicker. You need to cut it, keep it cool, and get it to the clinic within 24 hours after you cut it. So this isn't one that you throw on the dash of the pickup and you sometimes make it to Lincoln in the next month. No, this is one that you have to get right away because for Kevin to isolate it out, it's really difficult <laughs> because we're going to find the fungus in that vascular tissue. And that's really the only way to have a positive diagnosis. Now, for treatment, this is translocated through the root systems with two other oaks. There is tree injections that you can do, but keep in mind when you do a tree injection, they are pricey. And you are causing an opening in that tree every time you inject. And you have to come back and inject typically every one to two years. So that sets the tree up for Fred's wonderful bores, and then for myself for those wonderful canker diseases. Um, but if you're suspecting, it doesn't set an oak, it's oak wilt, sorry. I went with the wrong disease. Oak wilt, you need to get it into Kevin and have a positive identification because we are finding it in that southeast Nebraska area, Omaha metro area, so. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, you get the next picture. This is a viewer who has a tree that has daylilies at the base and uh, did some removal of the day, daylilies and discovered that the tree had been behaving poorly beneath that with a lot of surface roots, girdling mm -hmm. roots, surface roots. Wonders if, is the, what can be done for the health of the tree at this point. That's the difficult part is where there's so many um, what we call stem girdling roots, when you have a root that crosses over another root or is against the, the main trunk. When you have stem girdling roots and there's that many of them, it's difficult to properly remove them without harming the anchoring and the stability of that tree. So unfortunately, with that many stem girdling roots or that many surface roots, there's not a lot that they can do um, to remove them properly and for the long-term health of the tree. Now what's gonna happen on that tree is on the areas where it's girdling the main trunk. Um, you might notice that that side of the tree is gonna flag first. It's either gonna have smaller than normal leaves, the leaves are gonna drop off earlier than normal, um, different things like that. Once you start to notice those symptoms, that side of the tree could be failing either due to it not able to take up enough water or enough nutrients. And then at that point in time, you need to reevaluate with an arborist to see what's, what's the best game plan to make sure that that tree is in there as long as it can possibly be there. All right, okay, so we have for you, Fred, a, uh, an interesting picture. This is a viewer who found this when she was digging in her garden. She wondered what it was oh, and wow. is it a good guy, a bad guy, whatever. And I think she's actually got a scale on there. That thing is two inches long. Two inches long. Wow, I'm getting, I'm getting all the cool images from our viewers uh, this week. Uh, that, that's a tomato hornworm uh, pupa. Okay, let me back. So a tomato hornworm, that's the large worm that we see that gets on our tomato plants. Yeah, two inches long, often does some defoliation, rarely a problem. Okay, they complete development, they go down into the soil, they wiggle around and form a little uh, chamber, and they pupate. Uh, and this is what the, the image we just saw is a pupa that... Uh, of that tomato hornworm. From that, uh, a really beautiful little gray, pink, yellow moth will come out and look for other tomatoes to lay their eggs. So, you know, the caterpillar, the worm can cause some small amount of defoliation, uh, but in fact, really it's, um, it's not an issue. You might notice that, that little handle they had on them. Well, that that turns out to be where the mouth parts are, called the proboscis, because the hornworm, the adult, has this very long uh, mouth parts, so it can reach into, into flowers. And so that's where that is stored during the pupil uh, process. All right, thanks, Fred. Rock, uh, since we are now in the reseeding of the lawn process, <laughs> this is a viewer who wants to know what the proper amount of time is to wait between mowing and fertilizing newly seeded patches in the lawn. So it sounds like they've overseeded maybe. So they've got seed in the ground, it's coming up, they're wondering when they need to mow it first or whatever. Mow it as soon as you can. 
okay? So if it's up around two or three inches, people wait too long, and what thickens the lawn up is mowing. So the quicker you can get a mower on it, the quicker the lawn is going to thicken up. Okay, so first of all, mow as soon as you can. Um, you know, avoid, if you're still watering every day, it's going to be a little bit muddy. When you're at the point where you're maybe watering every other, every third day, um, then you're probably, and then it's tall enough, get that mower on it, get it as quick as you can. Um, in terms of fertilization, if you put a starter fertilizer down, you probably don't need to fertilize until, oh, after the fourth or fifth mowing. If you didn't put the starter fertilizer down, then you're probably going to have to fertilize after the first mowing. And just use any of the standard turf fertilizers, get it down on the ground. You really don't need this time of year a herbicide, and definitely don't use any of the granular weed and feed type products. All right. Thanks, Rock. Amy, you have two sets of images for two sets of fruit trees, the mm -hmm. first being pears and the second being apples. And the viewers, of course, want to know what and when. Okay. The first two image, images are going to be the cedar blank, so cedar apple, cedar quince, cedar hawthorn, rust. Um, they produce those beautiful orange pustule or lesions on the upper side. And as you can see on this picture now, those are the acial horns. That's producing the spores that are going to go back to the cedar tree. Once we start seeing those, there's really nothing you can do for the tree. Um, the spores are going to go back to the junipers and produce the galls that will have develop on the tree at that point in time, and then produce those beautiful orange masses in the spring once we get uh, nice spring rains. The second set of pictures that we're going to see, these are on apple, I believe. This is crab apple. You're seeing those silvery lesions on the leaf. The leaves are turning yellow. This is apple scab. And this is the time of year that we really start seeing that the leaves are turning yellow. You're going to see premature defoliation of the tree. With both of these diseases, the time to treat is in the spring as the leaves are starting to bud out. That's when we do the fungicide applications. Usually it takes one, if not two, sometimes three applications to cover those trees and to protect them. The big thing is if you're looking at replacing trees in your landscape, because fall is a great time to plant trees, there's a lot of beautiful resistant varieties to cedar, apple rust, uh, hawthorn rust, quince rust, and apple scab that can be easily incorporated into your landscape, and then you don't have to worry about these diseases. Long term, these diseases typically don't hurt your tree. They do cause premature defoliation, which makes the trees more susceptible to winter injury because it's not getting as much food and nutrient into that root base. Um, so we do see those trees decline over time um, because of that premature defoliation. But otherwise, fungicide applications in the spring, otherwise replaced with the resistant variety. All right. Thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a question from our audience um, from Carney. They have a transplanted rhubarb, gets about six to eight inches tall, no more, doesn't really get thick stalks, kind of short and really, really red. Any ideas on that one? The first thought would be, what depth is it planted at? Is it planted at the right depth? It might be planted too deep. Um, you might want to try to raise it back up. It depends, again, when it was transplanted. If it was transplanted this last season, you know, we don't want to pick from it for at least this season and pick very lightly from it next season, and it'll be another season before you can pick from it normally. So when was it transplanted is going to be the first question. The second question is at what depth was it transplanted and put at? Because um, it could be planted a little too deep. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Fred, this is from a Columbus viewer. They have cotone esters, and the branches get brown and die, and they're sort of covered with a webbing of some sort. Oh. They used eight, but it didn't really seem to help. So any that, notion? That, that sounds like a, the cotone ester leaf corpular is caused by a caterpillar, and, and the caterpillar uh, spins up the leaves, feeds inside the leaves, and it sort of leaves these skeletonized leaves. But it's all webbed up, so it remains. Uh, by the time you see that kind of damage, it's really too late to do anything about it. You really would want to treat about two or three weeks earlier when they're first starting to feed. So again, if you've had cotone ester leaf corpular on the, on the cotone, Tony Esther, go out you know, mid-July, early July, and, and look for the early damage. Then uh, uh, eight would work for quite well, which is permethrin. Even a BT product, you know, would work fairly well. But again, you have to make sure you treat with enough liquid uh, spray to get it to penetrate that crumpled leaf mass. All right, thanks, Fred. Rock, you get a, an image from a viewer who found this rather hefty plant growing in their rose garden. And it looked kind of cool, a little like a thistle, but wasn't pokey. They wonder, is it a keeper or is it a killer? Well, let's start out by identifying it, uh, 
Kim, and that's American burnweed. Which burn is as in burn as in fire, burn weed. And if you want, if, for the Googlers in the room, uh, you can Google that. The interesting thing about this weed is it wasn't prevalent in eastern Nebraska until, until actually this year, a little bit in previous years and, and previous years where we've had severe drought and whatever. So th the bottom line is, is they call it burn weed, not because it you know, looks like fire or whatever, but because it comes back after a burn on the prairie. It's a native prairie species, native to the Great Plains. So now it's showing up in thinner yards, thinner lawns. If you haven't got a big, really good serious mulch bed, then it's probably a good idea. It is a prolific seeder, and it is a one that we probably want to take out of the rose garden or anywhere else. The flower is kind of inconspicuous. It's kind of unique, but it really isn't much to look at. And they can get actually seven feet tall. That one there looked like it may have been four or five, but that's one you want to get rid of. And, you know, a, a hoe at the base, no herbicide needed. Just hack it off and, and uh, throw it in the compost pile. You should be good to go. Good. Right. Could last year's drought have anything to do with Oh, I'm increase? sorry, that's where I wanted to go. Anything that thinned anything. So rather than a burn, I, I meant to equate that. Thank you, Fred, for the, the very, very nice correction. Um, <laughs> is that because we've got thin areas and, and mulch and dry areas and they sort of contracted, that just opened up the ground for release because those seeds have been there probably 20 years and now you see it all over the place. So thanks, Fred, for um, the correction. <laughs> all right. My pleasure. Amy. You're welcome. <laughs> Amy, we have a viewer uh, from our audience who uh, from Seward. Mm -hmm. They have traditional purple, white, and rose lilac bushes and they all got powdery mildew this year. What's up with that and anything they should do about it? Powdery mildew, there isn't a lot you can do with it. It's associated with the high humidities. I mean, in Seward, you guys had a lot of problems with humidities um, during July and August. Uh, you can do a fungicide application. Uh, you could do a, ba a basic copper type product. Um, the trick is copper is a contact. So whenever you sprinkle it or there's a rain, you have to go back in and respray. Um, there are some resistant lilacs out there to powdery mildew, so you can always try those. Or if you have powdery mildew issues, either in phlox or viburnum or all those wonderful powdery mildew susceptible plants, there is some resistance. Uh, you can also try the home remedy of a tablespoon of baking soda to a gallon of water. Just like the copper products though, it's a contact and that's changing the pH on the leaf surface and you're gonna have to do multiple applications. It does help, it reduces it a little bit, but it does not eliminate it altogether. So uh, the one thing you can do, I forgot, is you can increase air circulation. So pruning other trees, pruning out the lilacs themselves so you get more airflow in there, does help reduce the severity of powdery mildew also. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, you get the next picture. This is a viewer who has the shrub, planted it uh, earlier in the season, not really thriving. They don't really want to know, they, they want to know what it is and whether the conditions that it is currently placed in are ideal or should they move it. And we looked at this picture earlier and we think that it's a sweet shrub um, and it really likes the moist environments. And so you need to make sure that it main, maintains that consistent moisture. Next. Usually Next the part sun, um, it can handle that part sun, but you know, that consistent moisture is going to be key uh, for this shrub that's to thrive the, in that location. The all right, Fred, you get the next question. This is a Columbus viewer. They have beautiful red and white petunias infested with what they're calling an inchworm. Light green in color, started uh, at noon, and by the evening, <laughs> flowers are gone. They're, they're wondering what it is and what to do about well, it. That, Kim, that sounds a lot like tobacco budworm, and we've been seeing a lot more of those in the last 10 years or so. The, uh, it's a little brown moth that flies up from the south every year. In fact, uh, you know, they don't overwinter in Nebraska, so it's a later season pest, and these are, they, the moths lay their eggs, the caterpillars hatch from the eggs, and they grow very quickly and just can devastate they like things like petunia, uh, geranium, uh, many of the other bedding plants. So the key is to catch them when it's small. When you first start seeing the little shot holes in the leaves, that's a time to treat. And they're fairly easy to control then using something like, uh, you could use something like Bioneem, like the neem product, or uh, permethrin or seven, uh, almost any product would do a reasonable job. BT, if they're small. But again, getting on top of it, watching for these little holes in the petals would be the time uh, to make that treatment. All right, thanks Fred. 
Rock, since it is time to seed, <laughs> do people really, if they're going to, if they're going to reseed, how? What are we saying about the window this year with it was cold and now it's really warm and dry? What are we saying? Well, if, in, if we lived anywhere but Nebraska, we'd make a better prediction. But um, <laughs> we're in our 22nd year in Nebraska, still waiting for the normal year. Because in a normal year, I hear that all the time from the natives, in a normal year, well, we haven't seen that yet. So all kidding aside, um, you want to get the seed in gr the ground Bluegrass can be planted as late as probably October 15 with minimal risk of winter injury. Tall fescue is a little bit more problematic, the turf type tall fescues, and we don't recommend any later than September 15. So if the temperatures remain hot, however, you're gonna have to get on them in maybe four cycles during the day of irrigation if you have an automatic system. If you don't have an automatic system, find somebody you don't really like and pay them to water five times a day because that's what it's gonna take if we, got, if we have weather like this. If it cools off, we get the, the rains, you're gonna be fine. So if we're worried about that and the projections aren't good, plant fescue, the turf type tall fescues, in the um, spring of the year and or dormant seed them. But really, bluegrass can go into October. Fescue, not so much because of the potential for winter kill. All right, thanks, Rock. Amy, um, this is a viewer who wonders about water lilies in, in a container water garden, and the edges have begun to brown. <laughs> Obviously, can't be lack of water. No. <laughs> so, what what do we think that might be? Um, it could actually be due to the heat. Um, the heat the last few weeks um, can really scorch those leaves as the light's reflecting off that water. It can cause a little bit of scorch. Um, if you continue to see a decline of the lilies, there is a root rot uh, fungus, fungus-like organism. Uh, called Phytophthora, that will mm. survive in the water. Mm. And it will infect those crowns of those lilies and then you will see decay of it. Um, those are a lot harder to treat. You're gonna be stuck trying to treat the water itself. Um, but if you think you're going that path, I would really suggest that you bring it into a county office or into the plant pest diagnostic clinic. But otherwise, I would probably lean toward just a little bit of scorch from the extreme heat and the sun because we didn't see the sun for a long period of time and all of a sudden we are again and it could just be a little bit of scorch. All right, during. thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, you have 15 seconds to answer a Randolph question about whether <laughs> barnyard tea would harm root vegetables if they used it as a watering mechanism and whether they can still eat them. Um, with the barnyard tea, also known as compost tea, because it contains manure, you know, we really can't recommend that they eat those root cups that it was watered with and any produce that it came in contact with just because of the possibility of there being something manure related um, in, that, in that tea.